Our gospel is Luke 13, verses 31 through 35. Luke 13, beginning at verse 31. At that very hour, some Pharisees came and said to him, Get away from here, for Herod wants to kill you. And he said to them, Go and tell that fox, Behold, I cast out demons and perform cures today and tomorrow, and the third day I finish my course. Nevertheless, I must go on my way today and tomorrow and the day following. For it cannot be that a prophet should perish away from Jerusalem. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it. How often would I have gathered your children together as a hen hen gathers her brood under her wings. And you were not willing. And behold, your house is forsaken. And I tell you, you will not see me until you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Gracious Heavenly Father, again we thank you that you have given us your word, that you give us your Holy Spirit, that you open our hearts and minds to hear as you speak. And so we pray that, you would, that we would be reminded today of what Jesus came to do for us. Of the call to repentance and faith. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. It would have been very close to this time of year, although in South America this time of year would be fall and not getting close to spring but uh, the little town where I went to first and second and third grades really didn't have four seasons we we really only had two seasons we had wet season and dry season so uh, we were probably you know towards the end of summer Uh, the dry season would be finishing the wet season would be coming on and uh, I suppose it doesn't really matter uh, But I know it would have been this time of year because dad had gone out into the community and I I guess you can tell if eggs have been fertilized or not and he knows how to do that. He never passed that little trick on to me how to tell if the eggs were fertilized or not. But he went out and bought a bunch of fertilized eggs from the neighbors and brought them and put them under our, our hens. So that, and he timed it so that they hatched right around Easter. So we had chicks uh, hatching around Easter, and you know, that was pretty exciting to go out and watch them peck their way through the shells and come out. We also had turkey vultures that frequented our town and would often sit on the rooftops around our yard. And whenever the turkey vultures would come and sit on the, on the peaks of, the, of our roofs, the hens would cluck. And all the chicks would run and gather underneath of the hen's wings uh, because she knew that those turkey vultures were after her chicks and she was going to protect them. So uh, I have a, a very strong image. And I, I, any of you, you don't, you don't have roosters, do you? You have roosters too? So, you, so do you have chicks? Do you ever let your eggs go to chicks sometimes? So anybody else remember chicks on the farm or chicks in the backyard? Some of you might uh, have hap- So, you know, for me, that's a very real picture uh, that I remember seeing the, the mother gather her brood under her wings. And so uh, in, in that little way, this text has a little bit of life for me. So this morning, we're going to look at uh, this event in the life of Jesus and And we're going to see three things about Jesus. First, that he was tempted by the fox. Secondly, that he was focused towards Jerusalem. And then thirdly, that he wanted to to gather 
uh, the children of Jerusalem, and I think that's to gather us today uh, as a hen gathers her brood. If we look back into the beginning of the chapter, Luke 13, and, and look at the setting, uh, Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem, and he's passing through the villages and towns uh, coming from Capernaum, which would have been in the northern part of Israel, up by the Galilean Sea, uh, and then walking south to Jerusalem, uh, and stopping in the villages and preaching and teaching and healing as he went. Uh, and so we have then this encounter that these religious leaders, uh, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, were the two primary religious political parties. Uh, in Jerusalem. There was another third party called the Essenes, uh, and they were more separated. They lived out by the Dead Sea uh, in the community of Qumran uh, and really didn't get involved in the politics of Israel. But we did have these two other groups, uh, and, and the third group that was probably a mix of both, the scribes. Now, the scribes were, they, they were called that because they were writers. Uh, and, but not just writers, they were people who were charged with preserving the scriptures. You know, so uh, if, if we use a book over and over and over and over again, eventually it tends to wear out and get, you know, the pages get thin and maybe we'll buy another one. Well, they didn't have books with pages back then. They had writing that was on... Uh, Parchment, which was lambs or, or calf skins that had been cured properly, and then they rolled them. They would write with ink on them, and they would roll them up, and as they rolled and unrolled them, the ink would crack off. So eventually you couldn't read them anymore. So that's how the Old Testament was kept at the synagogues. So as their scrolls would wear out, then the scribes were charged for copying new scrolls. And so they knew the scriptures because you know, who knows how many times in their life they had actually copied. They, they would have somebody who would read and then they, there was a group of them who would write uh, taking dictation from the scrolls to create new scrolls. So we have the scribes, but then we have the, the, the Pharisees and the Sadducees who are these political groups whose authority is being threatened by Jesus and the fact that Jesus is gathering a following and taking their followers away. So this group of Pharisees then comes out to meet with Jesus and to warn him about Herod. Now it's hard exactly to get behind the purpose here, but one of the suggestions here is that this is kind of a follow-up to our text last week. And if you didn't see the video I, I made for last week, you can go to Facebook and still see that, or go to our church website and YouTube. And, and we talked about the temptations in the wilderness. As we began Lent, the fact that Jesus went into the wilderness and was tempted by the devil. And what we saw there was that those temptations are, are, the, are part of a cosmic battle between the force of evil and God's will for us. And how the temptations were intended to get Jesus to rethink his purpose. And how by using scripture against the temptations, he was able to overcome the temptations and at the end of the text, it tells us that the devil left him for another opportune time. And now Jesus is getting close to the end of his ministry. He's headed to Jerusalem, knowing full well that he's going to be arrested, that he's going to be flogged, and then crucified. And it's very possible that this is a temptation that comes to him, that, that the tempter uses the Pharisees to suggest to Jesus that he ought to stop his journey towards Jerusalem and run. 
because Herod wants to kill him. Now, we don't know for sure if that was true or not. Uh, it, it doesn't seem, we don't have any other record that Herod was actually after Jesus. But the warning is there. Very possibly it's a false warning. Very possibly it's the tempter coming to Jesus and saying, uh, you ought to rethink this. And then it's interesting, Jesus replied to them, go and tell that fox. Now, again, it's a little bit hard to figure out what that exactly means. And you know, there's a couple different possibilities about the fox. He, he's making reference to Herod. Um, to us, a fox maybe is more a cunning creature, uh, a sneaky creature, right? It's the creature we're trying to keep out of the chicken coop. But it's also possible in their culture that a fox was just a little insignificant animal. And that what Jesus is saying here as he replies, responds to the Pharisees is, ah, I have nothing to worry about. Herod is nothing. Herod is insignificant. Just a little creature that's maybe pes pesky and pesty, but really nothing to worry about. But the temptation comes. And Jesus responds to the temptation and reminds the Pharisees and presumably those who are traveling with him of his purpose. That this is not a temptation that is going to pull him away from his purpose, but instead it confirms his purpose and his focus to go to Jerusalem. And so in his response, it appears there are some what we call colloquialisms. These, you know, these, these lists of days together are really more just part of the way they talked to talk about the fact that things have to go on. So, so we have, he says, today and tomorrow and the third day. And then later he says, uh, today and tomorrow and the day following. That there's not, we don't need to particularly find a great deal of meaning in the, the, those three days. But it's just simply the way that they talked about the focus and the process and the fact that they are going somewhere. And what we need to see is, is what he's doing where he says, I finish my course. And, and this, the terms there have to do with knowing that he has a mission and that he intends to fulfill the mission. And it's just put in common language and common words of their time. But he's being very clear to the Pharisees and to those who hear the temptation to walk away, to turn around, to not go to Jerusalem, that he has a purpose and he intends to fulfill that purpose, to finish the course. And then that's followed up in his next sentence when he says that he must go on his way. And this is a word that Luke, or yeah, that uh, Luke uses often in his uh, description of what Jesus does, and again that Jesus realizes his purpose, that this is something that has been preordained from him for him to do, and as we look at the whole of Scripture, we understand that this has been God's plan from the foundation of the world. And that, he, that it's something that Jesus has to do. He must. He is going to fulfill his purpose. And not only is he going to, but he must fulfill his purpose. He has to carry out why he's come. He has to finish why he's come. And then he puts that within the context of the mission and purpose of the prophets. 
And he talks about going to Jerusalem, the city that killed the prophets. And we saw in our reading from Jeremiah this morning how that history played itself out. Now Jeremiah's life was initially spared, although eventually he was against his will dragged off to Egypt where he was put to death. But so many of the other prophets were killed in or around Jerusalem. And so it brings us to the whole purpose and point of the prophets. And how Jesus understands himself and his ministry as a prophet. Now one of the things we often associate with prophets is telling the future. And, and God certainly did give many of the prophets a picture of what might happen, what God planned to happen in the future. But that was not their primary purpose. Prophets weren't supposed to be fortune tellers or future tellers. The primary purpose of the prophet was to call people to repentance which is what we saw in Jeremiah this morning. Why was he in trouble? Well, he was saying that the city of Jerusalem was going to be destroyed, but why? Because the people refused to repent. And as we look at the ministry of the prophets, that's what we see. That the prophet's primary purpose is to call God's people back to God. So Jesus then puts that in the, in the picture of the hen wishing to gather her brood under her wings. And he emphasizes the, in a sense, the emotional piece of this for himself as he repeats, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem. And you can begin to feel the passion that he has for the city. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that killed the ones that called you to repentance because you refused to repent. The one who stoned the ones that are sent to you, the ones who called you to repentance because you refused to repent. And then he expresses his desire. How often would I have gathered your children together? And so we see, I think here, his desire to gather us together under his forgiveness and protection. That if the prophet's purpose is to call us to repentance, then Jesus' ultimate purpose as he gathers and calls and brings us to himself is to forgive us. So then I am left with this question. What are we going to do with this? How do we respond? Because ultimately we are Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to us. And ultimately we are the children whom Jesus would gather under his wings. Jesus was tempted to walk away, to do it some other way. And that temptation will come again in the garden on the night that he is betrayed when for three hours he wrestles with his father, asking if there might be another way. But he loves us and desires us to be his. And he gives us this picture of the hen and her brood. As a prophet, he calls us to repent. To realize that we're selfish, 
We're full of pride. We break the commandments in word, in deed, in thought, in what we do and in what we don't do. And that we need to come to him daily, often, confessing our sin, hearing the call to repentance, and receiving his forgiveness. So that we can be his children, sheltered under his wing. Gracious God in heaven, the law is clear. And as we look at your will and what it is you want of us, we can only see how we offend, how we seek only for ourselves, how we so quickly break your will, how we succumb to the temptation. We hear your call to repentance. And even as Jesus looked forward to Jerusalem and to the cross, so help us to look back to Jerusalem and the cross. To see there the final and perfect sacrifice to take away sin. To see there a Savior who took upon himself our sin, became sin on our behalf. That as we repent, as we confess our sins, we would receive forgiveness and cleansing and adoption into your family. This we ask in Jesus' precious name.